we can go ahead and get started. I'm going to just uh, start with a little intro from my man Dan here, who is a futurist. He's also very much into blockchain. Right now, he's working at Pachyderm, a company that probably sounds familiar to a lot of you out there. They've got an MLOps tool that is spot on. He'll talk a bit more about it later, but we're not here to talk about Pachyderm today. We are here to talk about the machine versus the artist or the artist versus the machine, as we could say. <laughs> I think, Dan, you were able to create something that is so original. And for me, when you told me about it, it was like, whoa, that needs to be something that we talk about in a meetup because it is absolutely like it's it's completely out there and for you it's not that weird i don't think because you look at things in this way that the majority of us don't look at things being a futurist that you are but for me when you told me about it it blew my mind and so i i want to start by saying welcome thank you for coming it's really great to have you here thanks for having me on appreciate yeah. it and I know that you're in Berlin. You are a um, fellow German uh, resident right now. So cheers to that. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I think it will become apparent to everyone as he's talking later on about some of the music that he tried to make was like Berlin techno or if you read his article, which is like a prerequisite to this that I'll put in the chat right now it just talks about dance music and it talks about like the electronic scene. And it, it just made me realize how heavily influenced you are by Berlin. Uh, <laughs> you may not even realize that though. Oh, I realize it. I mean, Berlin is an amazing city with uh, an incredible, incredible culture throughout the years. And it's had so a good. huge music scene. Uh, much of it is still, uh, kind of shut down right now, even because mm -hmm. of the, the COVID stuff. So there's been illegal raves kind of out yeah. in the forests and they're opening up one of the most famous clubs with an incredible art collection uh, oh, right nice. now because nobody can go to it. So I'm probably going to check that out in a couple of weeks too. <laughs> so heavily influenced by this place. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So let's start with uh, just a quick intro on how you got into tech, how you got to be where you are right now. <laughs> Well, the simplest thing is uh, my father called me after I graduated NYU. He said, congratulations, you're going to pay your rent for a few more months, uh, get a freaking job. And I said, well, I, you know, I don't really know how to do anything. He said, that's your problem. Uh, figure it out. And so I was working as the assistant to the secretary at a tech company, uh, like an early software company. I'll date myself with the year. If I say it was 1998 and I ran nice. to the tech and I was like, teach me everything that you know. And he would go, okay, cool. And he would tear apart a computer and he'd say, put it back together and don't ask any questions unless you absolutely have to. And so I actually figured out that that was actually how you learn things in computers. So I BS my way into my first job and I spent all my nights there till midnight figuring all the crap I said I knew how to do. And uh, that became kind of a prerequisite. I started a company called Bulldog Data Services, which was early SaaS software, big Linux web farms, a lot of Microsoft back office consulting that I uh, ran for a decade and sold. And then I ended up working at Red Hat uh, for almost a decade on the sales engineer side. And I helped uh, kick off some of the artificial intelligence initiatives that they have there. I, was, I wrote a gigantic manifesto three years before anyone was working on it inside. Uh, and uh, well, three years later, they, they, they finally started to implement it. But uh, I, I felt like it was time to get back to the, to the startup team and to work with a small group uh, in the future and something a little more nimble, like the early days when I got to, to Red Hat, which is why I found Pachyderm. That's so cool. I love hearing about that experience. And now, Tell us about this project that you've been working on. I, give us, maybe, can you just give us the quick overview and then we'll dive in deep um, as we see fit? Yeah, I mean, the quick overview is I wanted to, I, I hate doing boring uh, tutorial kind of projects, right? It's like everybody cranks out a Hello World application and, and traditional software. 
And the equivalent of that in artificial intelligence is the Mint's data set or the Iris data set. And the problem with doing that is it just always kind of shows you one thing. It's very one dimensional. It shows you just about the software itself. But I have a very practical mind and I, I like to see things in context. So when I first started to learn programming as a uh, as a younger person, a lot of the books just didn't make sense to me because they go, cool, well, you've got an X variable and a Y variable, and there's an apple in one of those and a banana in the other, and then you swap them. And I'm like, well, why would you do that? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. And then I would realize later that you could swap file names or rearrange directories or whatever. So I had to see things in context. And also, I think artificial intelligence is still in an early phase. Like we've in, uh, I put together a couple of slides we can look at later, but there's a technology adoption curve that's very famous. It follows basically an S curve and traditional software is super well developed at this point. Machine learning is still in the early adopter phase. So I think it's really helpful to look at projects uh, that are going to kind of show what people are going to do in the future. And for me, the, uh, people get kind of nervous about artificial intelligence. That we, we, the bad things are well documented, but the amazing things are not as well documented, right? Mm. New medicines, drug discovery, all kinds of uh, new material science that we're able to come up with. But artistic stuff, artistic projects are really the ones that excite me. And I think when I start to look at music, which is what I did, I created an ambient music generating artificial intelligence. Um, I think that in the future, people are going to jam with artificial intelligence. They might play a few uh, bars, uh, a couple of chords or whatever, and the AI might pick it up and, and quickly dash off 50 iterations of that that you could kind of listen to and go, yeah, you know, play me 15 more of those, right? Mm. Um, and it just kind of develop along the way. So you, we'll be co-creating with the artificial intelligence. And uh, that's where I really see a lot of these applications starting to develop. And I wanted to say, what's the future look like here and develop an application around that. And I know that you've talked about it before in, in another video, but, which I'll link to now <laughs> in the, in the chat. But one thing that I found interesting was this idea of what, what did you call it? The Senate, what was it? The Senator? No, the Centaur. Centaur. Yeah. Centaur. Yeah. So Centaur. Centaur. Yeah, so the centaur is really basically humans co-creating or co-working with artificial intelligence. And so we generally have had this dialogue in artificial intelligence where it's very binary, right? Either the machines are going to replace us all or we're going to have to replace all the machines. Well, how about the third scenario where we're actually working closely with the artificial intelligence? It augments our way of doing things. It augments our understanding. And the, the term centaur came from uh, Gary Kasparov, actually. So Gary Kasparov, famous as the, the uh, chess player who lost to Deep Blue. And uh, that was this big moment in artificial intelligence. What most people don't know is the story that happened after that, which is he said, cool, I want to play Deep Blue again. I've been studying. I learned a bunch of things. I want to I beat the pants off this machine. And IBM was like, yeah, we already did this. Thanks. Uh, and, they, and we closed it down. So he sponsored a tournament where you could enter as an AI, uh, a human, or an AI human team. And what's interesting is the AI human team just cleaned up uh, and crushed all the competition. But what's more interesting is it was three expert chess players in artificial intelligence, not a grandmaster playing with artificial intelligence. So the artificial intelligence is able to level up his ability to do things. And when we see machine learning, artificial intelligence deployed in the real world, we see an alien intelligence. We see something that's different than us augmenting the things we don't do well. So ordering systems that are able to keep track of a thousand, 10,000 variables, the weather and supply chain and everything else, when it places all the orders, suddenly you have something like in auto in Germany, uh, where the AI does 90% of the ordering and people aren't getting laid off. They're moved into new positions that are more creative, where they're working on the advertising, beautifying the front end, all these types of things, instead of figuring out, well, I got to order 50 more umbrellas, I think. Uh, the machine can do those types of tasks better. Uh, and I think that we're just going to see more and more of that, which is very exciting. So I'm going to let you get into this, but I want to ask one more thing before you jump into these slides, which is this idea that you put forth about critical thinking in that talk that I just put in the chat. And I'm wondering how that ties into this project. 
Critical thinking is, I think, the most important thing in all of life. My great mentor was a high school English teacher uh, and still a good friend of mine many, many years later. Uh, we still visit him in New York City uh, in his 80s now. And he taught me that it's your education is the things that you're exposed to. Uh, can you think abstractly? Can you study information and know whether it's true? or false, uh, how would you even go about doing that? What type of heuristics and algorithms do you use in your own mind to understand and think for yourself rather than just consuming information and regurgitating it? Uh, and when you look at people who have really made a ma massive difference in the world, it is critical thinking that drove them uh, to that. They looked at a problem that everyone else said, well, this is the way that it is, that there's no way to do this, that can't be done, uh, and they came up with a totally different solution. In fact, it's a solution that I think computers can't do very well yet. Computers uh, actually at all, they can study patterns and digest those patterns. So you might be able to show them 5 million rocket designs and maybe they can optimize that design or give you a new rocket. But a human can conceive of the idea of a rocket that's never been created, do abstract reasoning, combine cylinders and thrust and chemical engineering, and come up with a plan to build a rocket and land that thing on, on the moon the very first time. And so that's something where we still have an edge on the machines um, and also critical thinking gives you a gigantic edge, not just in, uh, artificial, in artificial intelligence, but also in IT, in starting a business, creativity, art, everything in life. Uh, if you're able to think clearly about things, then you can go, long, you can go really far in life. Awesome. So I'll let you get into the slides. And while you're sharing your screen, uh, I'll, I'll just make a little comment on that idea of being able to jam with a machine and yeah. being able to have like a session where potentially you, yeah, you come up with a riff. I play guitar, so I would come up with a guitar riff and then the machine could instantly create a song from that or just give me back a few different guitar riffs and then like uh, dueling guitars kind of thing would be absolutely amazing. And especially these days when we're not really able to jam with friends being stuck at home. Yeah. And, and just think about like it filling in or being able to be a background singer or, you know, play the drums That's for you to amazing. fill in a part of it. Right. I mean, those kinds of things where it would just uh, be able to do all kinds of new things that we're not able to think of at this point. That's the whole thing is like, who's kicking this stuff off, right? And, and I talked about that technology adoption curve, right? So I graphed it out here. If you look at it, there's there, this book in, the 19, in 1962 called The Diffusion of Innovation shows this famous technology adoption curve. You've seen this now on every VC slide in the world, but it is actually really incredible when you think about there's really only 2.5% or so of innovators in the world. These are the people who come with a brand new idea. That's the, those are the critical thinkers, the visionaries, the crazy pins, right? That everybody says this, this is the way it is and you can't do it. Early adopters is really where we are in machine learning, right? Uh, that's where the, the software is not really perfect yet. If you think about traditional software, it's already reached a saturation point. It, it suffuses everyone's life. Think about in the 1980s, it took a team of thousands to develop a hideous interface of the database that was going to be used behind a corporate firewall for a couple thousand users with a waterfall development. Now we have DevOps, CICD, all these open source frameworks, APIs, drag and drop interfaces, whatever you want. And to the point that it took WhatsApp only 35 engineers to build a software that could reach 400 million people. Machine learning shares a lot with the CICD, but it's not the same process. And the software is still earlier. It's still in the early adopter phase. Early adopters are interesting. They don't need social proof to know that something is going to be true in the long run. Mm -hmm. They're able to look at it themselves, understand, project out into the future. They're willing to deal with bugs, jankiness, rough edges, et cetera. They're the influencers who start to push it into the early majority. Early majority adopts something, and they're the people who basically start to do kind of a wider dissemination of the technology. They're the people who uh, are, are, that's when the network effect starts to kick in, right? If, if you have Airbnb, it's not very interesting until you have a lot of people selling houses and renting houses on there. Oh, yeah. That's the early majority, right? 
uh, then you get the late majority who come in, be, they get it at a cheaper price, they, they need social proof, they look when a bunch of other people have done it, and then the laggards are the folks who basically only adopt it because they have to. So if you think about the cell phone adoption, if you know anybody using a flip phone, right, then they're still the laggards in the, in the technology adoption group for that, right? So we've got a long way to go with the machine learning software. And, and again, I try to pick things that are gonna show us kind of the future, right? Which is why, why I picked ambient music. And I'll, I'll share the deck with everyone today. I have the SoundCloud playlist that I've just, there's a bunch of songs that are already in the article, but in this one is just ones that I generated today with the AI. And there's also, yeah. just as a little aside, I don't know if you're going to mention it, but you do have, for people that love ambient music like us, you have a playlist on Spotify too. Yeah, so to. let, let, I'm going to do a full on screen share and just kind of flip through some things and share the desktop, do it and take the risk here. Uh -oh. we'll, go, we'll go crazy. <laughs> Boom, I've got the ambient songs for Creativity and Com. But th why did I select the ambient music? Because I've had this, this list for a decade. Uh, more than a decade, actually. It's survived through MP3s and CD rips and uh, Apple, and now it lives on Spotify, so you guys can follow it there. But I love ambient music, and I, I, I've highly curated this list, which means I have a highly curated data set, okay, which has allowed me to uh, get into like an alpha state when I'm writing. I literally listen to this playlist every single day, and I know it by heart, but it just kind of immediately flips me into a good, productive, deep work state, right? So much of the work now uh, that we do is where we're trying constantly to juggle 50 different interruptions, but deep work, creative work is totally different, right? Making music, writing an in-depth novel piece of code, uh, writing an article, these are things where you have to pay attention for hours at a time and tune out other things. And so that's why I love the ambient music. Um, let's see here. So I, but when, so when I started doing the project, I thought, man, there's a lot of different approaches to this that I could take. I ended up working with the Google Brain uh, Magenta Project Music Transformer. So that's a huge mouthful. Google Brain Team is uh, the research organization of some of the top geniuses in artificial intelligence, uh, pure research-based. Uh, and the Magenta Project specifically works with art, music, uh, visual generation. I, there's a, a lot of people who've tried to generate ambient music, and ambient music to me is this kind of soft, flowing, ethereal music. My uh, girlfriend occasionally jokingly calls it spa music. Uh, there's other kinds of ambient that has, uh, you know, kind of just sounds like white noise or whatever. I don't, I, I like it to have more of a melody, but I don't want it to have piano in there or drums. I want it to be a soft, flowing thing. So, when I looked at all the things that were out there, there's people have tried to use convolutional neural nets, but they're, they're a beast to train. There are things like WaveNet. And I read a paper that said basically in maybe 10 years, we'll be able to effectively model 10 or 15 seconds of a song properly with a WaveNet. Um, and because what happens with a lot of these convolutional nets or these WaveNets, which were developed for speech uh, synthesis, is they, uh, they are um, they they develop a kind of multiple personality, so they can generate a song for maybe ten five to ten seconds, and then a totally different song after that. They can't keep long term musical structure in mind. So, if you've been following artificial intelligence in general, you'll see that there were uh, a lot of breakthroughs with a transformer architecture. That's the architecture for time. GPT three that's getting all the overhype, but is also doing some really interesting things. It mm -hmm. came out of NLP, right? So in the past, people tried to deal with time series data and model music with things like LSTMs or grooves. The problem is they have a terrible recency bias. They tend to forget long-term structure, but they're just not very good at it. The Magenta Project messed with a lot of those. Then they came up with this attention mechanism, which came out of people studying how people read in neuroscience. And they said they thought people left just would read left to right or you know, and go over every line, but people's eyes jump around the page and kind of see the whole picture at once. They see these little hot spots and they form the text in their brain. So they, they modeled that in, with an algorithm with a, what's called an attention mechanism. And so they started using attention mechanisms with these big, heavy neural networks, convolutional nets, LSTMs, and attention. 
eventually the Google uh, research team came up with a paper called attention is all you need. And they dumped the convolutional nets, they dumped uh, the LSTMs and they basically just focused on LSTMs, which allowed them to train these huge models for NLP. Eventually the music team looked at it and said, maybe we can model long-term music like that. So the transformer basically will try to build it. You guys are all engineers. So you know that it builds essentially a key value pair of which words are important and how they're related to each other. Uh, there's a lot of math behind it. I'd let another data scientist explain it because I can't, but notice here it says the it, it's, you have a sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. A human knows that it refers to animal almost instinctually or because uh, your grade school teachers beat it into you in grammar mm -hmm. class, right? But uh, this is really complicated for an AI. So you notice there's a heat map that the darkest colors, the animal point to it. And there's a key value pair that's kind of happening for all of the words and how they relate to each other. The Magenta team modified it, and this is from their paper on the right, where you see one note relating back to all these other parts of the song in different ways, right? Um, and on both sections here, you see all these other notes which look sort of random uh, to something that's just modeling a second or two seconds of the song that uh, it really uh, can model a long-term structure. So it's the first thing that can really model a long-term structure. Um, the one thing that, um, the one thing about it that's sort of a downer is it can't model a direct waveform. So if you have a direct waveform, you can catch voices and all these background instruments. The problem is it's just incredibly difficult to model a, a, a direct waveform. It's very resource intensive. You could scale up hundreds of GPUs uh, and not be able to get where you want with it. So uh, what this ends up doing is converting it to MIDI. And MIDI is very interesting is that it was a standard that was created in the 1960s and 70s because you had analog synthesizers coming out which were these brand new things to people and they all had their own way of recording music internally so they came up with the standard so that the sony analog synthesizer could talk to the yamaha one and it basically is another way of recording notes the problem with it of course is that it's not really the whole song okay so you've got a if I record my voice, it's sort of like having a screenplay. I'm reading the words on the page, but I don't know how the actor is going to emote. He could say it with a deep voice, a high pitched voice, a lot of emotion, slow, fast. The, the MIDI captures some of that. It captures the speed of a note, the length of a note, um, but it doesn't really capture all the nuance. So we had to find a way to transform all of my playlist into MIDI and train on the MIDI and then generate songs with MIDI and then find an output for that. So there's a lot of different steps that are in there. And actually we did it in Pachyderm and I can, you can see Pachyderm, obviously the company that I work at, they've got, uh, it's an easy sort of pipelining system, data versioning system. And it, in, in this case, I've got kind of four pipelines. One is I just am throwing some MP3s up there that I downloaded. It's a second stage is converting it to WAV files. Third stage is using the Magenta Project's whole other neural network that learns a song and turns it into MIDI. So in other words, if I actually was able to go to all the artists and get the direct MIDI files from their computers, I'd have an amazing model. The fact is I can't do it. I have to take the music and somehow convert it into MIDI. You'd think that that would be easy, but it's not. Mm. <laughs> there's, a, there's no money in this, right? So there's a ton of projects out there on GitHub that are half-assed or haven't been touched in four years, right? It's just, and so they actually had to generate an entire neural net just to figure out how to try to, to record everything as MIDI. And then from there, it has to turn it into another stage, which is put it into a little uh, format that TensorFlow can understand. And then the last stage is basically training on big, big GPUs to try to learn the structure of the music transformer. Um, so that's what, you know, the, what is the nice thing about Pachyderm is it does, it does the data versioning along the way. So when I'm uploading all these things, it gives me this ironclad immutability, which is amazing. If you don't have immutability and you're just recording metadata, you don't have version control. Because if that data can change out from under you, okay, you have essentially have something that's worthless. Let's say I, I train a file, I train a model with 50 iterations on video files, and then another part of the team comes along and does some other kind of processing on that video file and overwrites that NFS mount, done. That metadata now points to something that no longer exists. 
So it basically has automatic tracking of all the versioning and lineage. This is another thing that the pipeline systems don't do very well. They force the coders to try to remember at each step to put in some line of code to remember the lineage. That's nonsense. The, the file system just does it for you, which is exciting. And it lets you reproduce this as ease. It basically can be these little JSON or YAML files, runs anywhere, and you can use any language or framework. So I've actually got a couple of things up here. I've got the, I've got, we'll just kind of get into the project. I've got the entire thing up on GitHub. It's got the ability to generate songs. So I've got trained models here that you can just download and run. It's already in there. You copy and paste this command down there and you just start generating a song. And in fact, I think I've got a song ready to generate here. I think it just did one here. I'll rename this song here and I just fire it up. I've got Docker running on my desktop. My fellow colleague, uh, Jamie Whitaker, who's a brilliant data scientist, made the code a lot cleaner so it can just call the, um, the Docker container and spit out some stuff uh, without me having to dig into it. So you'll see it'll just start generating a song. It's basically generating MIDI at this point. Um, and along the way, I also started retraining all of the, the Pachyderm um, the, the entire training pipeline. So Pachyderm is super simple to use. Um, I, there is the, be the beautiful interface. I just don't use it very often because it's an easy command line. Uh, you can do a Pachyderm, Pach control help. It mirrors a lot of the cube control commands because it runs on Kubernetes. In this case, I can see the, all the repos. It has a series of repos that are in and out. Oops, I always type repos because it's plural to me as, an, as a writer, but it's actually repo in here. I should probably do an alias. But in here, you'll notice that there's audio on process. It's got 1.94 gigs of MP3s. It's been processing into turning them into waves, and it's still trying to process through the MIDI's. 26 hours it's been running. I was hopeful that it would be done before this, but it doesn't really matter because I already have uh, the repo. But if I list the pipeline, okay, I can see um, the various pipelines that are running. And you'll know, you'll see that this one, 22 hours, it's been processing the MIDI and it'll just blurp them all out. The other pipelines are starting. So each basically in Pachyderm, you have a, a, a input repo and an output repo. And, and so on the left hand side, we've got the input and then where it outputs to. So when MIDI's done, it's going to, um, it's taking every, it's ingesting all the wave files from RDO processed wave repo, dumping them to a, another repo called MIDI. Once that happens, this next frame will start. The starting, it's, it's still starting here six hours ago because it's waiting for data to come in to that stage of the, the machine learning pipeline. The transformer pre-process will run very quickly once it gets all the wave data, and then it'll put that into a, tr uh, a TensorFlow format that TensorFlow can understand. Once that happens, it'll dump into the transformer pre-process, and the music and transformer will kick in. And so what does that kind of look like? If you look at... Each, each little stage is basically defined by this JSON or YAML file. This is JSON. A lot of the coders like YAML because you can do, um, you can do um, uh, notes inside of it, but JSON is just something that I uh, knew better. So I work with this, but basically I'm defining the pipeline. I'm saying how I want to transform it. I'm saying, what image am I running? So it's pulling a Docker container. Uh, which is uh, pulling from my colleague's Docker container, Kevin Scott, who was a, a programmer who helped me in this. Pulling down Music Transformer, it tells it what command to run, the Python 3. It's running a script called source slash train.fi. It's, it's going to do it for 500 epochs. It tells me where to ingest. It uses a virtual thing, PFS, stands for Packet and File System. Um, that's gonna, it's going to push it out there, which will then mirror what the actual name is down here. It's gonna run for X number of times. In this case, it needs a GPU, so I'm defining that GPU, and then it basically dumps it out there. It can be simpler than that too, right? Just the name of the pipeline, tell it what to command to run, and I can put anything in there. In the early stuff, I wrote some crappy bash, because you know I'm a terrible coder, and I, I put in um, this, but this all this thing's doing here is standardizing the names. So removing uh, spaces and uppercase and lowercase, putting dashes in there pushing them up to Pachyderm. The next stage is just an FFmpeg Ubuntu container, right? Again, with some more crappy bash on my part. Luckily, um, I was able to leverage some brilliant uh, subcoders to do the awesome Python and update all of the, the code from Magenta and get it working with its dependency hells. 
uh, and uh, and then basically all this is doing is using FFmpeg to convert MP3s. So when I call that in the file, it's basically saying, hey, just call this bash script in this container, process it from an input repo, dump it to another repo. It's really as simple as that. Uh, and so I think it's a very elegant system that ends up kind of uh, crafting something that's quite beautiful. And if we go back here, I'm still generating a song now. It's about halfway through, I'm generating one that's uh, several minutes long. And what you end up with when you're done with it is an actual MIDI file. And it, that's again, like just playing a series of notes. So there is this kind of centaur step, right? Which is you could use any music program, but I was using Logic Pro because I've got this Mac here. It's a really nice program with a ton of different software instruments. I basically just import that MIDI file. So I've got my sample ambient song, which is the one I generated yesterday or earlier today. Um, and generated a bunch of different software instruments. And you'll notice the software instruments on the side over here uh, would sound like very different, uh, different things. So I can basically change them out and see how the song will play. And there's an art to this, right? It's me trying to figure out which software instruments are going to sound good, or does the sample even sound good? Because it doesn't work perfectly every time. Sometimes it generates terrible samples or samples that don't uh, really sound great. I've been overall pleased with the samples that it's generated, but it's also done some, you know, some wonky ones that it doesn't matter what kind of software instrument you put it through, it's gonna sound like crap. But some of these are just really, the one that happened to come out yesterday came out amazing, and it sounded wonderful through, um, through, multiple, different, um, through multiple different things. So I, if I go to the end of it, you can see again what the pipeline looks like. And it kind of gives you a visual dashboard in the pack hub that we've got there. And then that's just me. I've got the article that people can look at, which is published on the, the Google Brain Magenta Project blog. And then there's just my Twitter and all that stuff. So that so I'm going to stop sharing now. I've got a few questions for you. But sure. You know, it, it really makes me think about like uh, synthesizers and how you, you've seen them undoubtedly like you can just pulse one note through a synthesizer and then the music is made by changing all of the different effects on it. Or yep. you can take like, um, people have probably seen when someone plays music by putting a plug into one place and then taking it out of another place. And it's yep. really like you're given the notes and you get to decide which notes you want to, or not which notes, you get to decide what, you, what sound you want to make with those notes by choosing the instrument. And then you can also put effects on that. You can put whatever you, you want on top of that and really like add to it. But I'm wondering, so my first question is, if I want to, because, you know, I'm, I'm into heavy metal, as yeah. you can tell. Like uh, I'm a pretty heavy metal, hard rock dude. Could I make some heavy metal with this? You, so you absolutely could make heavy metal with it, but you'd want to train it, right? Because um, when you like run something that's trained on ambient, like if I run the ambient music through pianos uh, or, or drums, it, it sounds like crap. And that's because it's just not generated to sound like, you know, a, there's a no classic. rhythm. There's yeah. no rhythm to it, right? And I, it, you could train it on that, but I didn't. And in fact, I chose ambient music because it, not just because I love it, but also because it gives me a little bit of leeway for one or two notes to just be wrong because it kind of blends into a seamless whole. Whereas if you've got a drum rhythm, it's like, dun, 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 and then all of a sudden it's like, Bruh? you know, you're like, wait a minute, right? It just sticks out like a rusty nail. And so um, it's much harder. And I, I did try to generate it. You made some reference to Berlin Technica. It's some of the biggest, baddest clubs in the world here in, in techno. Even the fact, I, I probably hadn't been to a club in you know, 15 years when I got here. And I, I even went to them because they were so exciting. They go for three or four days. It's nuts. They have these DJs that come from <laughs> around the world. And it's a totally insane scene. So I thought, man, I'll try to generate some of that. It gave me some of a sense of it. But I think my, my corpus wasn't big enough. I think my software instruments didn't have that kind of like edgy, like hard, grimy, bass heavy stuff. Maybe I could have found better software instruments. Uh, maybe I could have written some of my own, but it's just at that point in time, it, it seemed like people had done really good work with moving the sliders and these kind of ethereal instruments. And so uh, in some ways I got a little bit lucky too, that, that it, my instinct was right and ambient worked so well. Yeah. And Conrad's put in the chat here, 
saying maybe it's possible to use transfer learning to retrain it on heavy metal or hard rock or something like that. And you, you definitely could. In fact, I mean, we were doing transfer learning in some ways in doing uh, tra in the, the MIDI learning model. We used a, a model that was trained on piano and we were potentially, that was the one that, that Magenta gave us. And so we were doing a little bit of transfer learning there. We, we were tempted to try the, the drum machine one or to just train our own uh, model. But in the end, we just, we thought it was good enough to do a little bit of transfer learning there as well. So yeah, it, it would probably be feasible. So I'm just thinking like, how do you see this in the future being this, uh, you know, artists working with machines? How can you kind of look ahead and say, well, this is possible or that is possible now, because we know this, it's not only the machine that's creating it it has to be there has to be a human in the loop right but what other applications do you see for this well first of all i think all this stuff is going to have to get faster right i mean this stuff is still very cutting edge i mean you saw how long my pipeline was running just to get trained again even the inference right the ability to generate a new song of you know 2048 uh, bars essentially was taking 10 minutes or so to generate right so if an artist but theoretically, I think the early adopters in any kind of Photoshop for music with AI built into it, right? Think about kind of an AI app that's bubbling up ideas for you and saying, suggesting alternative instruments, suggesting chords to you, those kinds of things. I think it's going to have to get faster. We're going to need inference chips. We're going to need um, just more compute power. We're going to need better algorithms, right? At some point, you reach a convergence point where it's fast enough. So I think the early adopters might have the kind of clunky version of Photoshop for music, right? Um, or, you know, next gen Cubase or Logic Pro or, uh, uh, and, and they might go, cool, I generated 10 different songs, feed them to the machine and, you know, give me something overnight that sounds awesome and I'll listen to it tomorrow. But I think it really starts to take off when it happens in, in almost near real time, right? Mm -hmm. when, the, when the AI is able to really kind of riff with you, play parts of the song, um, smooth out songs, suggest alternatives, clean it up. Think about like an AIB is even right now we're so worried about, for instance, generating text uh, with artificial intelligence. Well, what if I actually had, what if I don't worry about it doing the creative aspect of coming up with this magenta music blog project and post, but it was able to go through my prose and just say, you know what, boom, you're using a lot of B verb constructions in here, right? It's, these, you know, if you're not a writer, you, you, you tend to write everything as is, is, was, were, right? It is, we are going. It's like, no, like a, a dynamic writer is going to, we're going, right? They use dynamic action verbs. And so what if the AI was able to look at that and go, boom, here's some really alternative constructions and I've smoothed out the prose and this paragraph's really heavy. Take a look at this, right? I, I, I really see it being a, like Google suggests for email on, on steroids in a lot of ways. Yeah, and you see that a little bit, maybe like Grammarly is trying to do that, but I end up most of the time with Grammarly just not liking what they suggest. Right. And it's not like they're helping my writing that much. They're just helping more like my grammar. It's not this holistic picture of, oh, well, you're writing about X. So maybe you want to, you know, try and use these, these different kinds of verbs or you, you, you've used this verb a lot, so don't use it anymore. Um, uh, moving on to Tim's question in the chat, he's asking what kind of spec machine did you use or what would you need to get into this experimentation? Is it better to run online or have your own PC? Yeah. So either, either one is fine. Um, I, I did the entire thing in pack hub, which we just launched. That's our, 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 um, SaaS service that's running in, uh, GCP now. And I was actually one of the, I was, it was beta while I was doing this over the last couple of months. So I was basically the first real customer along with a, one of a couple of their clients on the back end and just giving feedback and, and, um, uh, but I absolutely have a good AI workstation here with just a, a, a good laptop uh, with a, like one of the baddest, uh, I think it's a 20, uh, 20, 40, uh, one, just a massive like CPU, like the best GPU you could get at the time in there um, with eight gigs of RAM. And it's just, uh, you, if you had a desktop one with more than that, you could really crank through it. You could absolutely run this on a desktop. Does it need to be parallelized? 
Uh, if you could parallelize it, obviously it would go a lot faster. We didn't kind of get into those types of tweaks. If it were a production application, you absolutely would. The, everything up until the, uh, m the music transformer training just can work on the CPU. Uh, we probably could have refactored the code to use the GPU for the MIDI transcription, and that would have been faster. Uh, but that really just uses the CPU. So really, it could be done, you know, it's just sitting on your MacBook or a nice Linux box. But to train the transformer, you definitely need a badass GPU, um, or just kind of spin it up in the in Pack Hub and, and run it from there. Uh, it was pretty simple to do. So how about uh, the war stories on this? Can you give us some stuff that went wrong? <laughs> everything and what didn't go wrong right so I, I you know i don't like to hide the the stuff that doesn't work right um, you and i have talked about this too um everybody likes to show the smooth kind of stuff that, that went perfectly look even when, even now the song the sometimes it'll generate songs that i call like brain damage songs right it's like a couple of artists if i use them as a seed file so basically with the transformer you say here's a seed midi try to generate something similar to this or, or continuation of that certain artists it seems to have total brain damage and generates these eight minute long two or three note songs and for whatever maybe it just learned or maybe the midi transcription was particularly banned with that maybe it didn't get the nuance of it so that's one thing that went wrong all of this code is the same thing i see in every single uh software out there and like one of one of packaging's uh clients is a ipana data science they do these like multi-million dollar racehorses and they have to gather data from genetics data and web scraping and, and they had like 10 kids inputting it manually and imputing the data and gathering all together and taking weeks and and the problem with all this stuff is they said to me look so much of machine learning are these are these research projects this is not white glove software a lot of the time right it is if somebody comes up with an algorithm at a university writes the code and then forgets about it they're not on github maintaining that every day they're in the next research but somebody takes that obscure nlp library for a real commercial project they're going to be maintaining it they're going to try to get that hooked up in a docker container so we had outdated libraries you know like hard-coded variables right just like code that outright did not work because it's two or three years old for a lot of the steps of this and we tried a bunch of different ways to to do the mini generation and it sucked over and over again. And we, and we spent months just getting these research pieces together. And that's what Apana told me is they said, look, we use three or four different experimental packages, be able to put them into a container and say, boom, this container is done. I've figured out dependency hell. I've got the code in there. It's, it's immutable. I'm going to call that thing and it's going to work perfectly. That's it, right? It's like you don't want to have to go to like recompile that again, right? You just want to be able to call it. So that's really we that we fought through every stage from generating the MIDI and it crashing to um, you know pipelines freezing up to corrupt data to having to roll back to early versions to bugs in PackHub as I was developing it to um, things that were like, is this going to take? you know, three weeks to generate or two days, uh, you know, I, and what are we getting out of this? And then, you know, you run things through like, like the Berlin Techno Transformer, which had its own data set and it, it trained for three or four days and just, you know, I wasn't satisfied with the results. So yeah, a lot of things went wrong, took longer than I really thought, but that's really what data science is. You've got to, you've got to have the willpower. It's IT and data science is the same thing. You have to have the willpower. That's why I call my old company Bulldog Data Services, right? You have to like be a bulldog, you have to fight through it. And the only difference between me and everyone else is I just didn't go to bed until the damn web server was working, right? And the mail server was delivering mail, right? And, and people before me would go, well, it's, you know, it was, I left because it wasn't working. No, th there's, it's binary, it works or it doesn't. There's no in between, right? And so that's, that's still the problem with data science. Half of it is just this masochistic, willpower to get through it and and finish the project and we absolutely fought through at every stage which was fantastic and awesome so good to hear it is mm -hmm. it's so true man like it is very new and i'm sure a lot of people out there listening have gone through that and they know that exact feeling that you're describing right there so to finish up can you just talk to us a bit about how Pachyderm made this easier for you? Like just uh, give a bit of a plug for Pachyderm and why you thought it was awesome to use it. 
I mean, the simplest thing is like just being able to, like what I was talking about earlier, and, and this is what I hear from the customers, right? It's like, I think, you know, you don't, you don't have to make up a value case when your customers tell you this thing, right? It, and to me, I, I look, I've worked in a lot of enterprises and when I was at Red Hat, we had these killer products and we had these subpar products and we had below the line products and these terrible products that you're trying to invent a value prop for. Luckily, you know, Pachyderm's in that place where it, it does its work. Nobody's doing version control like us. They don't have an immutable file system, okay? Everyone's using this metadata logging server and I'm telling you, this is a recipe for failure, right? It's, it's something where it's like, if I record, okay, I trained 50 iterations of this model on this one mount point with a, with a million videos in it or a million images and then I, and I've recorded the metadata somewhere else, but that, that system doesn't, is not copy on write or not immutable. And I, and somebody, another team changes those. Maybe they just make the file smaller, right? The images, they lose some data in there. They crunch them down and make them smaller. All those training runs are screwed. That metadata points to something that is no longer true. So that's one. The other thing is when we talked about all those janky uh, sort of pieces of the puzzle with broken libraries and having to rewrite all this dependency hell, once you get that packaged up in the container, like I can distribute that to you super easy, right? It's like, boom, you go on that GitHub, it's got all the containers packaged up. You don't have to worry about going in and trying to recompile that stuff yourself. Whereas if you go to that individual project, try to download that code and spin up your own Ubuntu container and try to refactor it yourself, you'll spend another month on it. I can just pull down that code, write that little YAML file that says, call this little script in there and dump something out the other end. And being able to string those together in a smoothly functioning pipeline, I really just don't think there's any other pipeline system out there that's doing it. Um, and the other, or the ones that do do it well are totally proprietary. And to me, those aren't going to be a part of the canonical stack. Canonical stack is what is, is the term I'm using now to describe what becomes a dominant stack of a given era, right? Mm. If you, so you think about Kubernetes and Docker, you think about the Wintel dynasty, you think about um, VMware in, um, in, in the virtualization space, you think about the LAMP stack, the mean stack, all these things. We, the machine learning stack is not going to be a proprietary stack that lives on an individual cloud, right? If Kubernetes only ran on Google cloud, it would not be the dominant orchestration layer that it is across all clouds. So okay. every, every cloud's got their own thing, but Kubernetes ended up dominating. So, so, you, so something like SageMaker is always going to make money. It's Amazon. People are going to use it. They'll go all in. They'll, they'll accept the lock-in. But the fact that SageMaker is never going to run on Google Cloud or, my, or Microsoft Azure means it won't be part of that open source, open core, open, pure open source, canonical machine learning stack that's starting to develop now. We're going to see it develop over the next four to five years, and it's going to be an exciting time for all of us to be engineers and, and data scientists in this space. Hmm. Yeah, and so just in case you don't know out there, whoever you are listening, uh, Pachyderm is open source. It has an open source version, right? And you guys just Correct. opened up the Pachyderm hub or the Pac hub. What do you call it? Pac hub. Yeah. So that's the SaaS Pac service hub. that makes it easier to kind of just run the front end. You don't have to worry about managing Kubernetes or anything like that. You just click the little button, spins it up. You got your dashboard and you can just start talking to it and ingesting data. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's absolutely wonderful. So if anyone else has any other questions they want to fire off at Dan, this has been absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm in love with this project and I want to, you know, train my own ambient music to go to sleep with, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it is such a, a great type of music to work with or just to relax to. And uh, I, I want to thank you, Dan, for coming on here and breaking this down. If you have not read the full article, get out there, read it. You've got it in the chat, or if you're listening on podcast land, it is in the show notes. Uh, I've got one more question from Mohammed. He's asking okay. if Pachyderm has A-B testing features for models in production. So we, we generally start, so we generally push people to things like Selden or model serving frameworks to deal with canarying, A-B testing, all those kinds of things. You could do it with Pachyderm, um, leveraging it as a pipeline, but we prefer to push people towards a, a, a model serving framework that really is designed to show that dashboard, show which version you're using, sunset things, do a little blue-green test, et cetera. 
Um, we could certainly build that into the pipeline, but we'd, you'd have to do more heavy lifting. So I would trust that kind of work um, to uh, a, a, a purpose-built uh, product like uh, Selden's. Uh, well, and products. it goes back to that. It's the whole debate, right? Do you want to do one thing or do you want to try and do many things? And you're saying, hey, we're going to just stick to the one thing that we know how to do well. And yep. we're going to go deep in that. And then for the other stuff, you can talk with someone else uh, that is doing their thing really well. And so I think you had told me about before on this canonical stack, you're looking at various different types of open source that you put together, right? And yep. it's, uh, it's interesting that we, we land on that right now because there's a chat going on in the Slack general channel and it's talking about you know using open source and putting something together, some kind of pipeline that is going from end to end with only open source tools. And so that's kind of how you all are envisioning it at Pachyderm. You're saying, yeah, we, uh, we see it like that, right? Am I correct on saying that? You are. So I've got an article that I'm, I'm working on now called The Rise of the Canonical Stack in the, in the next three, three or so weeks that'll probably be out. We spent a lot of time trying to think about what the different stages are. People are still trying to even define what the stages are in some of this thing. And you see these kind of, uh, these what I call the NASCAR slides. Everybody loves this post, where it's got 30 categories of machine learning with like, and it's just logo hell. Yeah. That, that, first of all, there's not gonna be 30 categories of machine learning. There's gonna be three or four in a stack, right? And um, so I, we spent a lot of time internally trying to think about abstract what those are, and then kind of say, hey, here we think are the emerging leaders in this point. And then also, um, including competitors and everyone else, right? And because it's still an emerging uh, software battle, right? Um, it hasn't congealed into like Kubernetes, Docker in, in, that, in that way, or, or VMware and KVM, right? As mm -hmm. Wintel, right? Uh, Microsoft and Intel, right? Hasn't converged into that. And so um, I built, I think, a good four stage framework. And I, I'm very open about saying, hey, this whole section of the stack not ready yet, right? We don't really have tools in this case. Um, you know, you, you're, there's some hand, you're still going to do some hand labeling or there's nothing really tracking the decisions of a machine learning model, not just monitoring whether it's running, uh, which is one thing it's going to have to do like, a, like an elk stack or a Prometheus, but also, hey, I'm logging the decisions over time so I can go back for compliance reasons or when it starts making weird mistakes, I know why. So there's, there's things that just don't exist but I am starting to see a lot of movement and you know, things congealing around certain pieces of open source frameworks. And I think really within the next three to five years, it's going to really start to, uh, to form its own uh, critical lamp stack for machine learning, if you will. Yeah, and that begs the question, where do you see things kind of pulling together and forming around? What is it? Well, I mean, again, I think it's going to be a, a cluster of different things, but it's going to, you, you're you going to have brand, I think what you'll end up having is brand new IDEs, right? So it's not just going to be the kinds of IDEs that we have now. You're going to have an intelligent IDE that bubbles up solutions that writes part of the code for you. Now, I don't think you're going to see this in three to five years, but you're definitely going to see like a, a new kind of IDE. You're definitely going to have a pipeline framework in there. You're going to have data version control, code version control, no question about it. You're going to have a model serving framework in there. You're going to have a hyperparameter tuning and scaling system. Uh, mm -hmm. They may, again, all overlap in some ways or be part of similar systems. You're going to have a monitoring and management, not just of, hey, can I run the inference at scale? Can, is it running? Is it serving queries in real time? What kind of decisions is it making? Is it, is it flagging every new credit card as fraud? I need to understand that, not just, hey, the inference engine's online. I need to know that it's logging X percentage of fraud, and is that in line with the model? Which version of the model am I using? So there's going to be a whole end-to-end -end stack that's developing, and I think it's going to be you know, be between two and four pieces of software that kind of congeal together uh, into, into something consistent. And then it'll probably evolve again as machine learning itself evolves because this is, uh, it's going to be evolving over the rest of our lifetimes hmm. into brand new things. Absolutely fascinating. As always, Dan, I love talking to you. If anyone wants to continue the conversation with Dan, you can find him on our Slack channel or you can hit him up on Twitter your handle dan i can't remember it's dan jeffries right dan it's, it's underscore dan jeffries. underscore jeffries one if you just do dan underscore jeffries 
that person studies the asexual reproduction of tree frogs. We've had a lot of funny back and back and forth on it. It is Dan <laughs> underscore Jeffries, the number one, uh, unless you're interested in the asexual reproduction of tree frogs. <laughs> I swear to God, this is not, it's totally true. This is not, I am not making oh this up. God, that is he, hilarious. He, he got a ton of traffic for me uh, as my <laughs> medium following was exploding. And we had a, a bunch of funny dialogues back and forth. Yeah, I'm sure people were wondering like, oh, you pivoted. Yeah, he yeah. Really, yeah he's really changed this. He was talking about AI, and crypto, and future technology. And now he's talking about asexual reproduction. So random. Talks. Yeah, it's so, just a random change. Hit him up on Twitter. Follow him on Medium. Also, he's got a lot of wisdom passing along to all of us on there. And I'll leave it all in the show notes for you. I really want to thank everyone who stuck around. I want to thank you again, Dan. We will see you later next, next week. We're probably not going to have a meetup. So I'll, I'll tell you all about it later. But that's it. Yeah, Thanks. that's our Thanks, show guys. for today. Thanks for the great questions. Appreciate it. See you, man. Bye.